the 9,451st meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. The agenda is adopted. I would like to warmly welcome the Secretary General, distinguished ministers, and other high-level representatives present in the Security Council chamber. Your presence today underscores the importance of the subject matter under discussion. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representatives of Algeria, Argentina, Australia, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Belgium, the plurinational state of Bolivia, Cambodia, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Cuba, Czechia, Egypt, Finland, Germany, Guatemala, Hungary, Iceland, India, Indonesia, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Iraq, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Malaysia, Maldives, Mauritania, Mexico, Morocco, Namibia, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Peru, the Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Qatar, the Republic of Korea, Saudi Arabia, Sierra Leone, Slovenia, Spain, South Africa, Sri Lanka, the Syrian Arab Republic, Thailand, Tunisia, Turkey, Ukraine, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and Vietnam to participate in this meeting. It's so decided. I propose that the Council invite the Minister of Foreign Affairs and expatriates of the Observer State of Palestine to participate in this meeting in accordance with the provisional rules of procedure and the previous practices in this regard. There being no objection, it's so decided. On behalf of the Council, I welcome His Excellency Riyad al-Maliki. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provision Rules of Procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Mr. Thor Venezland, the Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, and Ms. Lynn Hastings, Deputy Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, Resident Coordinator and Humanitarian Coordinator for the Occupied Palestinian Territory. It's so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I also invite the following individuals to participate in this meeting. His Excellency, Mr. Sheikh Nyang, Chair of the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People. His Excellency, Mr. Olaf Skook, Head of the Delegation of the European Union to the United Nations and His Excellency Mr. Ahmed Abulgait, Secretary General of the League of Arab States. It's so decided. I also propose that the Council invite His Excellency Archbishop Gabriele Caccia, Permanent Observer of the Holy See to the United Nations, to participate in the meeting in accordance with the provisional rules of procedure and the previous practices in this regard. There being no objection, it's so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. 
I now give the floor to the Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres. Mr. President, with your permission, I would make a small introduction and then ask my colleagues to brief the Security Council on the situation on the ground. Excellencies, the situation in the Middle East is growing more dire by the hour. The war in Gaza is raging and risks spiraling throughout the region. Divisions are splintering societies, tensions threaten to boil over. At a crucial moment like this, it is vital to be clear on principles, starting with the fundamental principle of respecting and protecting civilians. I have condemned unequivocally the horrifying and unprecedented 7 October acts of terror by Hamas in Israel. Nothing can justify the deliberate killing, injuring, and kidnapping of civilians or the launching of rockets against civilian targets. All hostages must be treated humanely and released immediately and without conditions. And I respectfully note the presence among us of members of their families. Excellencies, it is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and plagued by violence, their economy stifled, their people displaced, and their homes demolished. Their hopes for a political solution to their plight have been vanishing. But the grievances of the Palestinian people cannot justify the appalling attacks by Hamas, and those appalling attacks cannot justify the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. Excellencies, even war has rules. We must demand that all parties uphold and respect their obligations under international humanitarian law. Take constant care in the conduct of military operations to spare civilians and respect and protect hospitals and respect the inviolability of UN facilities, which today are sheltering more than 600,000 Palestinians. The relentless bombardment of Gaza by Israeli forces, the level of civilian casualties, and the wholesale destruction of neighborhoods continue to mount and are deeply alarming. I mourn and honor dozens of UN colleagues working for UNRWA. Sadly, at least 35 and counting, killed in the bombardment of Gaza over the last two weeks. I owe to their families my condemnation of these and many other similar killings. The protection of civilians is paramount in any armed conflict. Protecting civilians can never mean using them as human shields. Protection civilians, protecting civilians does not mean ordering more than one million people to evacuate to the south, where there is no shelter, no food, no water, no medicine, and no fuel, and then continuing to bomb the South itself. I'm deeply concerned about the clear violations of international humanitarian law that we are witnessing in Gaza. Let me be clear, no party to an armed conflict is above international humanitarian law. Excellencies, thankfully some humanitarian relief is finally getting into Gaza, but it is a drop of aid in an ocean of need. In addition, our UN fuel supplies in Gaza will run out in a matter of days, and that would be another disaster. Without fuel, aid cannot be delivered, hospitals will not have power, and drinking water cannot be purified or even pumped. The people of Gaza need continuous aid delivery at a level that corresponds to the enormous needs, and that aid must be delivered without restrictions. I salute our UN colleagues and humanitarian partners in Gaza working in as, under hazardous conditions and risking their lives to provide aid to those in need. They are an inspiration. To ease epic suffering, make the delivery of aid easier and safer, and facilitate the release of hostages, I reiterate my appeal for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Excellencies, even in this moment of grave and immediate danger, 
we cannot lose sight of the only realistic foundation for a true peace and stability, a two-state solution. Israelis must see their legitimate needs for security materialized, and Palestinians must see their legitimate aspirations for an independent state realized in line with the United Nations resolution, international laws, and previous agreements. And finally, we must be clear on the principle of upholding human dignity. Polarization and dehumanization are being fueled by a tsunami of disinformation. We must stand up to the forces of anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim bigotry, and all forms of hate. Mr. President, Excellencies, today is United Nations Day, marking 78 years since the UN Charter entered into force. That charter reflects our shared commitment to advance peace, sustainable development, and human rights. On this UN Day, at this critical hour, I appeal to all to pull back from the brink before the violence claims even more lives and spreads even further. Thank you very much. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Thor Veneland. Mr. President, Excellencies, members of the Security Council, I thank you for your sustained attention to the grave developments unfolding in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory, particularly in and around Gaza. In light of the horrific violence of these past weeks, allow me to begin by expressing my most sincere condolences to the thousands of families in Israel, Palestine and across the globe who are in mourning, in shock and in profound pain. This includes the families of 35 UN staff killed in Gaza. The abhorrent attack launched by Hamas on 7 October and Israel's devastating ongoing military operation in Gaza have taken a staggering toll on civilians and deeply shaken Israelis and Palestinians alike. As I told this council last week, and the Secretary General has just expressed, the events we are witnessing are unprecedented. They risk expanding to the wider region and may have profound long-term impact on the dynamics of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mr. President, on the morning of 7 October, Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups launched a large-scale complex assault on Israel. The unprecedented attack saw an estimated 1,500 Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants from Gaza in infiltrate some 20 Israeli communities and military facilities in the Gaza periphery by land, sea and air, while thousands of rockets were launched towards central Israel, including Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Testimony and evidence emerging from the Chantic Day reveal a sickening killing spree designed to terrorize with appalling scenes of brutality, massacres, hostage-taking, including against infants and young children. In all, Hamas and other Palestinian militant groups killed over 1,400 Israelis and foreign nationals to blot this attack in Israel's history. This includes over 1,000 civilians, many of them women and children, and over 360 security forces personnel. Over 5,400 Israelis were injured. At least 220 civilians, including women and children, as well as soldiers, were abducted and taken into Gaza Strip as hostages. While not confirmed, Hamas has said that 22 hostages were killed by Israeli strikes. I welcome the release of four hostages and recognize the important role of Qatar in this regard. To the families of hostages, some of whom are with us today, the fear and uncertainties you have had to endure is unimaginable. As the Secretary General and I have said repeatedly, your loved ones must be returned to you immediately and unconditionally. Heavy fighting between Israeli forces and militants inside the Israeli communities continued until 10 October when the Israeli Defense Forces said it regained control of the perimeter fence. Over 120,000 Israelis were displaced 
from the area. <clears throat> Hamas and other Palestinian militant groups in Gaza have continued to launch indiscriminate rocket fire from Gaza into Israel, reaching as far as north as Haifa. To date, according to Israeli sources, some 7,700 rockets have been launched. Mr. President, on the day of the attack, Israeli security cabinet declared a state of war for the first time in over 50 years with the aim of, quote, the destruction of the military and, go and governing capabilities of Hamas and Islamic Jihad, unquote. That same day, Israeli forces began a massive bombardment of what they said were Hamas sites throughout Gaza. Israeli air assaults in the Strip has continued to date with some 5,000 such sites targeted, according to the IDF. On 8 October, Israeli Minister for Defense announced the complete siege of the Gaza, blocking all entry of goods, including electricity, water, food, fuel, and medical equipment. The airstrikes have been devastating and resulted in a staggering number of Palestinian fatalities, a vast number of whom are civilians thus far. The Ministry of Health in Gaza has reported over 5,000 Palestinian killed, including 1,100 women, 2,000 children, as well as journalists, medical workers and first responders, with more than 15,000 injured. Authorities estimate that hundreds more lay dead under, or injured under rubble as rescue efforts languish amid continuous airstrike. Over 1 million Palestinians have been displaced. The level of physical destruction has left entire neighborhoods in rubble and critical infrastructure has been destroyed or damaged. Schools, including UNWA schools and hospitals, many sheltering displaced Palestinians have been hit. Displacement levels are unprecedented. Compounding the destruction from airstrikes, the humanitarian impact has been immense. In this regard, I welcome Egypt's facilitation to open Rafa border crossing on 21 October and reiterate the humanitarian assistance needs to flow safely and continuously into the Strip. I echo the Secretary General's appeal for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Lynn Hastings, the humanitarian coordinator in the OPT, will report in full on the humanitarian situation on behalf of the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths. Mr. President, the risk of significant further deterioration in the situation of the occupied West Bank or spillover of the conflict in the region remain significant. Violence in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, already at worrying level, has increased since the outbreak of the war. Israeli authorities have imposed widespread movement restrictions and conducted extensive arrests. High number of daily clashes and armed exchanges between Palestinians and Israeli security forces and settlers have been recorded, as well as settler-related violence and Palestinian attacks against the Israelis. Since 7 October, 93 Palestinians, including 27 children, have been killed by ISF or settlers, and one Israeli security personnel was killed in an armed exchange. Large demonstration in solidarity with the Gaza population took place in cities across the West Bank, with some leading to confrontation with Palestinian security forces. Meanwhile, across the blue line and amid heightened rhetoric and actors on the ground, there have been daily intermittent but intense exchanges of fire since 8 October. Hezbollah, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad have launched rockets and anti-tank missiles towards Israel, while IDF responded with artillery fire and airstrikes, leading to casualties on both sides. On 13 and 20 October, two journalists were killed. Palestinian militants from Lebanon have also made several infiltration attempts, the most significant on 9 October. Over 80,000 Israelis have been evacuated from homes and some 20,000 Lebanese have been displaced. On the Golan, the Israeli Defense Forces responded on 10 October with artillery and mortar shells towards what they said were a number of launches from Syria towards Israel. Syrian state media reported Israeli air attacks on 12 and 22 October targeting the international airports of Damascus and Aleppo, and on 14 October, Aleppo International Airport. 
UNDOF continued to engage with both parties, urging them to exercise maximum restraints in respect of their obligation under the 1974 agreement on the dis disengagement of forces. Mr. President, the Secretary General has been very clear in expressing the UN condemnation of the horrific attacks by Hamas and others on 7 October and deep alarm over the scale of Israeli airstrikes and the scope of civilian casualties and destruction in Gaza. Over this past week, the Secretary General and I have been pursuing any and every opportunity to address the situation on the ground and to prevent further civilian death and misery. It is critical that we, as a united international community, employ all our collective efforts to end the bloodletting and prevent the further expansion of hostilities, including in the region. The stakes are astronomically high, and I appeal for all relevant actors to act responsibly. Any miscalculation could have immeasurable consequences. In this regard, I welcome Egypt's convening of the Cairo Peace Summit on 21 October and the efforts of the state in the region and beyond to address the unfolding humanitarian catastrophe for us and to pave the way for unlocking a real and serious peace process. Mr. President, these devastating events are not divorced from the broader context of the occupied Palestinian territory, Israel and the region, where dynamics are deeply intertwined. The unresolved conflict and continued occupation shaped the reality of every Israeli and every Palestinian. For 15 years, the Palestinian population have been living under militant rule and a strict closure regime as the Palestinian divide hardened. For a generation, hope has been lost and despair has prevailed for those who see prospect for a more peaceful future pulling still further away. Only a political solution will move us forward. The steps we take to address these crises must be implemented in a way that ultimately advances a negotiated peace and fulfills the legitimate national aspiration of Palestinians and Israelis, the long-held vision of two states in line with UN resolution, international law and previous agreements. Thank you. I thank Mr. Venezland for his briefing. And I now give the floor to Mrs. Lynn Hastings. Mr. President, thank you for this opportunity to update the Security Council on behalf of Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths. At the outset, I want to welcome the release of two hostages on Saturday and another two yesterday. We are grateful to the Arab Republic of Egypt and the Mir of Qatar for mediating their release and to the International Committee of Red Cross for facilitating. However, the more than 200 hostages still being held must be released without condition or any further delay we welcome all diplomatic efforts to secure their release and demand that in the interim, they be treated humanely and be allowed to receive visits from the ICRC. As intense airstrikes continue to rain down on Gaza and as indiscriminate rockets fly into Israel, death, injury, destruction and displacement are mounting. On the Israeli side, the fatality toll is more than three times the cumulative number of Israelis killed since OCHA began recording casualties in 2005. In Gaza, the reported Palestinian fatality toll of the past 17 days is more than double the total number of fatalities of the entire 2014, a war which lasted 50 days. Women and children comprise some 62% of these victims. The number of those who are internally displaced has swelled to 1.4 million. Nearly 600,000 people are sheltering in UNRWA facilities in increasingly dire conditions. The average number of IDPs per shelter has reached 2.5 times the capacity. As my colleagues have repeatedly highlighted, 
there is nowhere to seek refuge in Gaza. When it comes to decisions on whether and where to flee, civilians are damned if they do and damned if they don't. Displaced families are reportedly returning to North Gaza due to ongoing bombardments because their basic needs, including safety, cannot be met in the South. I reiterate that civilians must be protected and have the essentials they need to survive, whether they move or if they stay. To give you an idea of the scale of destruction, according to the Gaza Ministry of Housing, at least 42% of all housing units in the Strip have already been either destroyed or damaged since October 7th. The scale of destruction calls into question the ability of people to ever return to their homes. Meanwhile, Gaza remains under a full electricity blackout. Hospitals are on the brink of collapse due to shortages of electricity, medicine, equipment, specialized personnel, and the damage and destruction. Patients are being treated on the floors due to a shortage of beds. Doctors are being forced to operate without anesthesia. Since the 7th of October, 16 health workers in Gaza have reportedly been killed and 30 injured while on duty. Mr. President, in the middle of this tumult, the agreement to use Rafa crossing from Egypt to get essential humanitarian supplies into Gaza has provided a glimmer of hope to people living in the appalling, appalling conditions. This past weekend, 34 trucks entered Gaza with life-saving supplies and another 20 crossed Rafa into Gaza yesterday. 20 more of those are due to cross to today. We welcome this important development and we pledge to do our part to ensure these deliveries increase and continue. But these deliveries are a drop in the bucket compared to the vast scale of needs. They amount to no more than 4% of the daily average volume of commodities entering Gaza prior to these hostilities. Needs are now, of course, significantly greater. And most crucially, the deliveries made over the past few days do not include fuel. That is essential for powering the services that are needed for people to survive. Without fuel, our humanitarian operation will stop. No fuel means no hospitals functioning, no desalination of water, and no baking. Many people are drinking saline groundwater increasing the risks of diarrhea, cholera, and other health issues. We urge Israel to bring water and electricity supplies back to pre-conflict levels and to work with us to find a secure way of bringing fuel into Gaza. While we negotiate with the government of Israel as to how best to bring fuel into Gaza, we have 400,000 liters of trucks ready to go. This would provide fuel for approximately two and a half more days. If the civilians across Gaza are to get access to adequate food, water, medical care, and other essential supplies, we must be able to scale up deliveries of all goods, and we must be able to replenish fuel supplies. It will be important also that the Israeli crossings for the movement of people and goods are opened. I want to express my mo my utmost admiration for the bravery and extraordinary commitment of those delivering life-saving and humanitarian services in Gaza. This includes the incredible staff at UNRWA, many of whom are displaced themselves and who continue to support the most vulnerable despite it all. We must also pay tribute to the 35 UNRWA colleagues who have tragically been killed. I urge the Council to redouble funding to UNRWA and other humanitarian agencies on the ground without delay so they can continue these indispensable efforts. Mr. President, today of all days, when we celebrate the United Nations, we must all continue to demand respect for international humanitarian law. The parties on all sides must take constant care to spare civilians 
including medical and humanitarian personnel, civilian objects, including homes, hospitals, and humanitarian assets. Civilians must have the essentials to survive, and to this end, the passage of rapid and unimpeded and increased humanitarian relief must be facilitated and water and electricity connections resumed. I urge all countries with influence to exert it and ensure respect for the rules of war. Mr. President, agreement on the resumption of aid deliveries and the release of a small number of hostages over the past few days shows that through diplomacy and negotiations, humanity can prevail and we can find humanitarian solutions even in the depths of this conflict. In this spirit, I reiterate the Secretary General's call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire to ease this epic human suffering. If we are to prevent any further descent into this humanitarian catastrophe, dialogue must continue to ensure essential supplies can get into Gaza at the scale needed to spare civilians and the infrastructure they depend on, to release hostages, and to avoid any further escalation and spillover. The world is looking to the member states around this council to play its part in leading the way. Thank you. I thank Mrs. Lynn Hastin for her briefing. And I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Hiad Al Maliki, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates of the Observer State of Palestine. Mr. President, we are here today to stop the killing, to stop the massacres being committed against the Palestinian people. The ongoing massacres being deliberately and systematically and savagely perpetrated by Israel the occupying power against the Palestinian civilian population under its illegal occupation must be stopped. The Security Council has a duty to stop them. The international community is obliged under international law to stop them. It is our collective human duty to stop them. Now, continued failure at this council is inexcusable. Mr. President, we express appreciation to Brazil for convening this session of the Security Council and elevating its participation in light of the gravity of the situation we are facing. We thank the Secretary General of the United Nations for his sobering briefing and for his tireless efforts and that of the UN agencies and humanitarian staff on the ground, particularly UNRWA, working round the clock under the most inhumane conditions to aid our people and uphold a minimum sense of humanity. We mourn with them the senseless killing of UNRWA staff and other humanitarian workers, including doctors, nurses, and paramedics who were directly targeted by this ongoing barbarous aggression. They are heroic champions of humanity at a time of abject depravity. Mr. President, over two million Palestinians are on a survival mission every day, every night. By the time representatives are done delivering their speeches today, 150 Palestinians will have been killed, including 60 children. In the last two weeks, over 5,700 Palestinians have been killed including over 2,300 children and 1,300 women. Compared to the population of Gaza, that is the equivalent of 145,000 British citizens or 700,000 US citizens. Almost all those killed by Israel are civilians. Over 1 million displaced, 170,000 housing units destroyed. Excellencies, only international law and peace are worthy of your country's unconditional support. More injustice and more killing will not make Israel safer. No amount of weapons, no alliance will bring to it security. Only peace will. Peace with Palestine and its people. 
The fate of the Palestinian people cannot continue to be disposition, displacement, denial of rights and death. Our freedom is the condition of shared peace and security. You have all spoken of the Palestinian people's legitimate grievances, addressing them, of their legitimate aspirations, help achieving them, of their right to self-determination, support its realization. For those actively engaged to avoid an even greater humanitarian catastrophe and regional spillover, it must be clear that this can only be achieved by putting an immediate end to the Israeli war launched against the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. Stop the, blood, the bloodshed. There is no amount of humanitarian aid that can address the situation if more death, destruction, and devastation are imposed on our people in Gaza. There is no way to contain underlying tensions in our region if that reality does not change. There are so many fronts open for war and none for peace. Some of my colleagues spoke to me about the pain and anger of the bereaved families. Every family in Gaza is a bereaved family. No one is spared. No one is safe. Where is the solidarity with them? Where is the empathy towards them? Where is the outrage for their killing? If these expressions are genuine, they cannot be accompanied by excuses for the killer and reasons for him to continue the killing. We should be on the same side, all of us who believe in justice and in peace, in the rule of international law, in the value and sanctity of human life. We should stand shoulder to shoulder in these moments, but that is only possible if, there, if everyone recognizes the value of Palestinian life, the need to uphold Palestinian rights. This is only possible if you offer unconditional support to the rule of international law and the objective of peace, not to those breaching the former and destroying the latter. Sooner or later, you will have to admit that the interests of your countries and those of this Israeli government are not aligned, but rather opposed. The sooner you recognize it, the more lives can be saved, the more chance we have to walk back from the abyss. It may be hard to imagine in these circumstances a different reality. The effort and energy it would take, the difficult choices it implies, the political cost it carries, the changes to policies it entails. But as we said repeatedly, it is worth it. Because of the alternative, the only, the one we are living in right now, the one the Palestinian people have been experiencing for decades, there is a reality where no Palestinians and no Israelis are killed, where all enjoy equal measures of freedom, peace, and security. That reality is the one that deserves all your efforts and all your resources. Invest in peace, not war. Support justice, not vengeance. Stand for freedom, not justify continued subjugation and occupation. Billions of people from all faiths and all origins care about the fate of the Palestinian people. They measure against it all the statements and positions of your countries. They consider it the ultimate test for the values one proclaims and the norms we all enacted. In Gaza, under the rebels lies over 1,000 Palestinians and all the values and all the norms. Under the bombs, two million Palestinians and all the values and all the norms. Abandoning the Palestinian people is betraying those values and norms. You either rescue the international law-based order or leave it to die there. We thank all those who have taken an equivocal position and offered support, starting with the countries of our region. 
who understand more than any other the implications of the continued inhumane and barbaric attacks against our people, but also countries across the globe, peoples in your streets, the moral voices of this world, please listen to them. You have families, and some of you evoked them when Israelis were killed. How you could not but think of your loved ones and what pain and suffering you would feel if they had endured a similar fate. I am therefore convinced you cannot be numb to a reality where all the people you love, your parents, grandparents, siblings, children, grandchildren, aunts, uncles, and cousins, and in-laws are all in danger of imminent death, or worse, have all been killed in one strike, in one instant. That is happening repeatedly. Can you feel their pain? Can you imagine the day after for them, for that child who is the only survival for his entire family? Can you then imagine how we feel when anyone claims this is for the better? Can you imagine your loved ones besieged and bombed, deprived of the essential goods for their survival, their fate, dependent on decision to allow or prevent fuel, water, and food from entering with any delay, meaning a death sentence for many. Families should be re reunited in life, not in death. If you say you are for international law, international humanitarian law, and for protection of civilians, then nothing can justify what Israel is doing. This is targeting of civilians, or at best, inhumane, unlawful, indiscriminate attacks. This is collective punishment. Once you remove the principles of humanity and distinction from the laws of war, nothing remains. These are crimes and should be treated as such. What Israel is doing is constant with its belief that we are subhumans or human animals, as they put it. But surely you don't share that belief. You do not believe our lives are less worthy, less secret, more expendable. So imagine what you would do if bombs were falling on Israel, killing civilians by the thousands, and then ask why is this any different? Israel has killed thousands of Palestinians over the years, and, do, and yet, no one suggested that entitled us to start killing Israeli civilians. Neither and, and, uh, under a right to defend ourselves, to protect our own, or to resist. Your message was always clear. Nothing can justify killing Israeli civilians. Well, nothing justifies killing Palestinian civilians. Nothing. I will turn right now to speak in Arabic, please. Say the Rais, Mr. President. Is it not the Security Council's duty to maintain international peace and security and preserving the principles and purposes of the UN Charter that have guaranteed to our peoples to save the generations from the scourge of war and taking these joint and effective measures to prevent the causes that threaten peace as per the principles of international law and justice, or is it difficult for your Security Council to uphold its responsibility and its mandate and resolutions without selectivity or double standards when it relates to Palestine? 
Is it not uh, the Security Council's role to address uh, the aggression that targets uh, newborn babies and men and women and children and providing Palestinian civilians with protection against the continued crimes of the occupation and addressing the root causes of the issue and addressing the reasons for instability and insecurity? which represent the desire of the occupying Israeli uh, power to uh, colonize the Palestinian people. Peace and security pass through the gate of empowering the Palestinians and their enjoyment of their inalienable rights and not through evading this path and ignoring their suffering. Mr. President, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and I quote, the disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind, end quote. Here, I address the international community and ask, represented by your council, is your human conscience not offended by the crimes of the Israeli occupation over the course of 56 years of its colonial occupation, or by the terrorism, killing, destruction, and starvation to which the Palestinian people are exposed today? Doesn't this wholesale killing offend you? through the Israeli targeting of innocent persons and, uh, and houses of worship and other uh, civilian objects and the humanitarian staff, depriving our people of their humanity it does not offend you. The statements by Israeli officials do not offend you that call for ethnic cleansing and genocide and that describe the Palestinian people and children as children of darkness and as human animals in order to allow for uh, killing. Does this not offend the uh, conscience, the continued blockade for 16 years and the starvation of the people and the prevention of water, food, fuel and other necessary supplies? Does not does this not offend the human conscience to target uh, civilians in Gaza in, as well as Jerusalem and in the West Bank and the desecration of holy sites and the magnitude of civilians that must fall so that your august council can call for ending this madness and impunity? Do not mistake the devastating war against the civilians in the Gaza Strip is an extension of the aggression by this occupation against our people to continue its colonization of our land. Peace and security cannot and will not be achieved by crushing the skulls of infants or through wiping out Gaza or turning it into a hell or reducing its area as has been announced repeatedly by everyone who carries out this killing and destruction. It will also not materialize by arming thousands of terrorist settlers and encouraging them to continue their terror attacks against our people in Jerusalem and the occupied West Bank. Mr. President, the Palestinian children in Gaza are writing their names on their hands so that they not become unknown corpses and so that they not be buried in uh, 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 collective uh, graves. This is a revenge against children and women and civilians, which has been agreed by the world to prevent, uh, and the purposes of the UN Charter has sought to contain that and, and prevent it. Yes, Mr. President, Israel is avenging uh, against women and children and the entire Palestinian people. They are uh, taking revenge uh, on the victim, the victim that continues to demand its rights to freedom and independence and return. The people who remain resilient in the face of aggression supported by hate speech led by the occupying authorities who want to continue the crime of the Nakba. As our great poet has said, Mahmoud Darwish, we are the victim that has tried all forms of killing, including the most modern weapons, but we are the miracle that does not die and cannot die. 
end quote. The world witnesses the killing and destruction and mass arrests and displacement carried out by Israel against the Palestinian people and has coexisted with these crimes and impunity and even protected it instead of searching for a radical solution to the occupation, ending the occupation and realizing the rights of the Palestinian people is the only way to ensure regional and international stability, security and peace not killing more Palestinians. The serious escalation in the area is, the is mainly caused by the absence of rights, and therefore the urgent solution required from the Council today is to call for immediate cessation of the Israeli aggression and ceasefire and to work urgently to secure humanitarian access in all parts of the Gaza Strip and to end the forced displacement and to provide international protection for the Palestinian people and achieve justice through accountability. In addition to the necessary practical measures to address the root causes of the issue and end the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory with Jerusalem as the capital of the Palestinian states as per your resolutions and as per the, the peace process and international law and also empowering the Palestinians to enjoy their inalienable rights, including the return of refugees and self-determination as per Resolution 194. War and peace start from Palestine. Our area has suffered enough wars. Gaza today is the world capital. All eyes are fixed on Gaza. Do not fail the test. There is a resilient people in Gaza who have tolerated what no human can tolerate. Enough torture, enough killing, enough injustice. Long live Gaza and long live Palestine and long live freedom so that peace can live for long. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency Mr. Al-Maliki for his statement. And I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Eli Cohen, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Israel. Mr. President, Minister of Foreign Affairs, members of the Security Council, as we meet here today, young babies, children, are held in Gaza. This is beyond imagination, a living nightmare of three, 10 years old, Avigail, three years old, Maya, 17 years old, Raz, four years old, Aviv, two years old, Ariel, four years old, Fear, little fear, only nine months. Yuval, eight years old. Ophir, 17 <coughs> years old. There are just a few, a few of the many children and babies that have not seen evil. They have not caused evil, but they are victims of evil. These kids witness horror which cannot be described by word. Mr. Secretary General, in what world do you live? Definitely, this is not our world. Do I want to remember the creation of hell, the shouts of the raiders in joining the hunt, cries of the wounded, begging for life, faces of mothers craved with pain, hiding children, dripping with fear. No, I don't want to remember. But how can I forget? Do I want to remember this world upside down? Families vanish in the midst of the day, the mass grave steaming with vapor of blood, Mothers screaming for children in vain. No. I have to remember and never let you forget. 
This heart-burning poem was written by Alexander Kimmel, a Holocaust survivor in 1942. Five years later, the United Nations General Assembly voted in favor of the creation of the Jewish state, the birth of the state of Israel. 75 years ago was a clear statement, never again, never again. Saturday, October 7, will go down in history as nothing less than a brutal massacre. Saturday, October 7, is a wake-up call for the entire free world, a wake-up call against extremism and terror. On that day, over 1,500 terrorists of Hamas and Islamic Jihad infiltrated Israel from the south with a viciousness exceeded even ISIS, killing over 1,400 babies, children, women, and men, and wounded over 4,000. They went from house to house, slaughtering entire families and individuals in the beds, on the streets, on the way to the synagogue, raping women, burned them alive, dancing and chanting on people's bodies. You have not been there. You have not seen the horror or smell it. Let us pause for a moment. Think about many innocent people. Innocent people, they just wake up in Saturday morning. So many of them are not yet brought to a final burial. And let's recite the immortal words of the Jewish prayer for the dead, the Kaddish. It gadal v'it kadash shmerabba. This massacre will go down in history as more brutal than ISIS. Hamas are new Nazis. Hamas are the new Nazis. Just as the civilized world united to defeat the Nazis. Just as the civilized world united to defeat ISIS. The civilized world has to stand united behind Israel to defeat Hamas. Let us know mistaken about Hamas' intention. I'm sure, Secretary General, you can read it. Its charter clearly call for the destruction and elimination of the State of Israel. This will never be. Over 220 were taken hostage. Among the hostages, children who have seen their parents murdered Holocaust survivor, elderly in need for care and medicine. We call for immediate, the Red Cross access to all the hostages and their unconditional release. Present in this room, Moran Aloni. Seven members of his family were taken hostage Moran's sister, Sharon Aloni Konyo, and Daniel Aloni were kidnapped with Sharon's husband, David, and their three-year-old twins, Emma and Yuli. Three years old twin. Right now, while we are sitting here, they are all by the Hamas. Alongside Daniel's five-year-old daughter, Amelia. Early morning, early Saturday, on the 7th of October, Sharon wrote on her family group chat that there are Hamas terrorists in their home and they are hiding in the safe room. A few minutes later, she wrote that the terrorists set the house on fire since if they are not able to enter into the room and to slaughter them, they burn the houses in order they will get out. And they written that they are choking in the safe room. 
A few minutes later, Moran received a private message from his sister. We are dying. Help us. The family received information that Sharon, Daniel, Emma, Yuli, Emilia, David, and Ariel, David's brother, are held in captive by Hamas terrorists in Gaza. Here with us is another family, Hirsch Goldberg Polin, a young man, age 23, one of the beautiful and innocent participants in the music festival. Hirsch is seriously injured. On his phone, the last two text messages he managed to send to his parents before he was kidnapped to Gaza, I love you, I'm sorry. That's what he wrote to his parents. There are other family here with us today, the family of Itai Chen, Kit and Aviva Segal, Liad Benin, Idan Alexander, Omer Ventura, and there is so many more. Qatar, Qatar which finance and harbor of Hamas leaders could influence and enable the immediate and unconditional release of all, of all hostages held by the terrorists. You, members of the international community, should demand Qatar to do just that. The meeting should conclude with a clear message, bring them home, bring them home. I would like to listen to this recording. This is a terrorist of Hamas. What he said in there in Arabs, he telling to his mother and fathers that he is proud, that he has blood of 10 Jewish that he murdered. What monster they gave a birth to. Secretary General, this is the world that we live. We give Palestinian and Gaza till the last millimeter. There is no dispute in regards to the land of Gaza. But they take the money they receive from the world. And instead of building hospital, office building, commercial center, they took the money to dig tunnels, to build rocket factory, not for the favor of their people. This is one example. And you see, and you can show all the movies that they film, and they're proud of this. The low leaves were not speaking on behalf of Islam. Human values or fight for freedom. They were speaking on behalf of cruelty, malice, and hate. And you should all ask yourself, ladies and gentlemen, who do we face? We, Israel, we don't only have the right to defend ourselves. We have the duty to do so. This is not a right. This is a duty. I want to speak to all of you and to tell you, the West is next. The West is next. The war which was imposed on us, there is no side. This war was imposed on us. It is not only Israel's war. It is the war of the free world. I hear the call for proportionality. I hear the calls, as said Lim before, for a ceasefire. Tell me, what is a proportionate response for killing of babies? 
for rape women and burn them, for beheading of a child. How you can agree to a ceasefire with someone who swore to kill and destroy your own existence? How? The proportional response to October 7 massacre is a total destruction, a total destruction to the last one of the Hamas. It is not only Israel's right to destroy Hamas, it's our duty. For Israel, it's a matter of survival. The free world should remember and never forget what happened on October 7th. Today, this barbaric terror hit Israel. Tomorrow, it will be at everyone's doorstep, at everyone's doorstep. These terrorists don't have only Israel destruction in mind. Their dream is the world. Read about it. Exactly like the Nazis. They say it. They are willing to expand. This war was imposed on us. We have not chosen this war, but have no doubt. We are going to win it. We are going to win it because this war is for life. This war must be your war as well. As Iran's proxy, Hamas, has three objectives to its barbarous attack. The murder of Jews, the kidnap, being of hostages, and the railing, the expansion of peace, stability, and normalization in our region. United will, will and purpose like never before. Israel must now act in an unprecedented way to ensure Hamas objectives will never be met. Will never be met. This is the aim, the 18th day since the beginning of this war. Through the last 18 days, our citizens were under heavily missile and rocket fire from Gaza, and not only from Gaza. There is a clear attempt on escalating and provoking a war on our northern border, where the Iran proxy Hezbollah is targeting our cities. The objective of Hamas, its patron, and collaborator is clear. They will not succeed. Not only from neighboring country, Israel is facing threat. Last week, cruise missiles were launched at Israel from Yemen. Have no illusion who is behind it and what is the reason. I told, I'm telling to our Arab country and neighbor, we share the same threat of Iran and the terror organization. The same threat. I stand here in front of you saying loud and clear, this war will be won. And for the international community to understand who is under threat and who is the aggressor. Mr. President, colleagues, permanent representative, the world now is facing a clear choice of moral clarity. One can either be, one can be either part of the civilized world or surrounded to the forces of evil and barbarism. Hamas savages and their friends. There is no middle ground, no room for moral ambiguity, no room for this. I want to thank all the government who's already designated Hamas as a terror organization. And I call others to do it immediately. I want to thank the United States, President Biden and Secretary Blinken for showing such a moral clarity 
for standing with Israel in word and deed at this dark hour. Thank you. I also wish to thank the many other leaders from across the world who have come to stand with Israel in this difficult time. I would like to remind you the charter here of the United Nations, which you all signed, begins with this word. We, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. Today, after the most vicious and brutal terror attack in the modern history, if all nations do not stand decisively and clearly by the innocent orphans left alone in the world, by the kids that were slaughtered while dancing at sunrise, by the Holocaust survivors murdered or kidnapped, Stand by Israel on our mission to eliminate the monsters from the face of the earth. Of the earth. If all nations do not stand by the basic value, the basic value of humanity described in the UN Charter, this will be the darkest hour, the darkest hour of United Nations under you. Mr. Secretary, at this place, and this place will have no moral justification to exist. At this difficult time for the people of Israel, we say loudly, we are strong. We will rebuild. We are determined and resolved to achieve our dream, to be a free nation in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem. Thank you. I thank His Excellency, Mr. Cohen, for his statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Brazil. I thank the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, the Special Coordinator for Middle East Peace Process, Mr. Thor Venezland, and Deputy Special Coordinator Resident and Humanitarian Coordinator for the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Mrs. Lim Hastin, for their briefings. We were witnessing we are uh, witnessing unprecedented levels of violence in the region. Since October 7th, more than 5,000 lives have been lost on both sides, and more than a million people have fled their homes in the Gaza Strip. Allow me to quote President Lula on his appeal to reason. Hamas must release Israeli children who were abducted from their families. Israel must cease bombing so that Palestinian children and their mothers can leave the Gaza Strip across the border with Egypt. There needs to be a minimum of humanity in the insanity of war." End of quote. What President Lula is underscoring is that we are dealing with both a hostage and a humanitarian crisis. The acts of terrorism carried out against civilians in Israel resulted in over a thousand victims and the abduction of hundreds of innocent people, including children and the elderly. Three Brazilian citizens have been confirmed dead victims of Hamas attacks. We, as we deeply mourn their passing, we cannot condone acts of terrorism. Violence only breeds further violence. I want to make an appeal, therefore, for the immediate and unconditional release of all civilian hostages in safety, in particular of women and children. Acts of terrorism are heinous and criminal, and international law is clear on the ways to address it. The Security Council has created a significant body 
of counterterrorism norms. When counterterrorism efforts disregard basic norms and principles, including on the use of force, they reinforce rather than counter the narratives of terrorist groups. Hence, as an effective strategy to address the terrorist threats, it's imperative to ensure full respect for human rights, humanitarian law, and refugee law. Children must always be treated primarily as victims in a manner consistent with the ri their rights, dignity, and needs. The escalating violence in Gaza is also unacceptable. So is the demolition of civilian infrastructure, which resulted in the destruction of 42% of civilian housing. We cannot tolerate the loss of over 2,000 Palestinian children, as the occupying power, Israel has a legal and moral obligation to protect the local population under international humanitarian law. The recent events in Gaza are particularly concerning, including the so-called evacuation order, which is leading to unprecedented levels of misery for innocent people. The number of trucks with humanitarian aid that cross the Rafa border is utterly insufficient to meet the basic needs of the local population. The entire territory is without powers, continues without power supply, impacting the work of health personnel. Hospitals are operating beyond full capacity. Access to drinkable water has been impeded, and many are resorting to improper sources of water. Civilians must be respected and protected at all times and everywhere. All parties must strictly abide by their obligations under international humanitarian law. And I highlight in this respect the fundamental principles of distinction, proportionality, humanity, necessity, and precaution, which must guide and inform all actions and military operations. Distinguished delegates, we must not lose sight of the root causes of this conflict. Oppression, social and economic inequalities, recurring violations of human rights. 2023 marks 75 years since the beginning of the Israel-Palestine conflict. It is disheartening to see the lack of progress in the peace process between Palestinians and Israelis. The stalemate in the peace process has been fueling an unsettling rise in violence. Even before the crisis in Gaza, 2023 was already the year with the highest death toll since 2005. The situation in the West Bank remains tense, with successive harmful incidents escalating into violence and leading the civilian casualties. The surge in shelter-related violence is also alarming. Achieving peace requires strict adherence to international law, as well as working towards realizing the two-state solution. As clearly stated by this Council, the continued occupation of the West Bank is unlawful and undermines the prospects for peace. Israel must stop all settlements activities in the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. The difference of treatment towards settlers and locals is unacceptable. The current and projected expansion all but erases the viability of a future Palestinian state and engenders violence and hatred. We also underscore the importance of preserving the historic status quo at the holy sites in Jerusalem and acknowledge the significance of the Hashemite custody. Brazil urges all parties to exercise maximum restraint and abstain from provocations, including the use of extremist rhetoric. Intra-Palestinian reconciliation is also pivotal. We acknowledge the meetings in Egypt focus on exploring reconciliation efforts among Palestinian factions. We encourage the continuation of diplomatic engagements to regional peace processes. Brazil praises UNRWA's invaluable humanitarian work for one of the world's most vulnerable refugee populations, the Palestinians, and we 
mourn UNRWA's brave workers who lost their lives in the line of duty since the beginning of current hostilities. Our commitment to UNRWA is reflected in our availability to hold the vice chairmanship and the chairmanship of the agency's advisory commission from July 20, uh, 2024 and July 2025, respectively. Distinguished delegates, the broader Middle East has long been entangled in a web of conflicts. These conflicts lead to immeasurable suffering, grief, loss, hardship, and worst of all, hopelessness. They also severely destabilize the region. Now we see the very concrete risk of the crisis in Gaza spilling over to other parts of the region. Amid all these daunting challenges, diplomacy and dialogue remain as our most powerful assets. The maritime dispute between Israel and Lebanon has been peacefully settled through negotiations. Similarly, the recent rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran underscores the potential of good faith engagement. The establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Arab countries also show the willingness to engage and cooperate. Such endeavors bring hope and peace in the region. The League of Arab States plays a vital role in this context by working tire tirelessly to mediate and foster dialogue between conflicting parties. Distinguished delegates, the Council has a crucial responsibility in the immediate response to the unfolding hostage and humanitarian crisis. Much of the reputation of the United Nations depends on its approach to the ongoing crisis. Since 2016, the Council has not been able to pass a resolution on the situation in the region. Obstructive strategies have been impeding the crucial decision on international peace and security be taken. As a result, the situation in the Middle East is by far one of the most thwarted issues in the Security Council. This Council must be up to the challenge before us we will likely be tried and found guilty by future generations for our inaction and complacency. We must find ways to unlock multilateral action. Focusing on disagreements will not lead us to the direction of much needed solution to the unfolding dire hu human crisis. The Security Council should not shy away from its responsibility of calling for the liberation of the innocent people abducted from their families, as well as for their safety, well-being, and humane treatment. This is a broad political call for the opening of urgently needed humanitarian corridors. A decision on the humanitarian aspects of the current crisis is within a hand's reach of the council members on condition that we refrain from politicization of the already complex situation on the ground. Brazil will continue to promote dialogue among members and action on the part of the councils through the opening of possible avenues of negotiation. In this spirit, President Lula instructed me to attend the Cairo Peace Summit the past Saturday with an a, unequivocal message to add Brazil's voice to all those who are urging calm, restraint, and peace in the region. Despite the various positions of the member states they are represented, consensus was possible on four major aspects as follows the end of violence, the implementation of ceasefire, the establishment of humanitarian corridors, and the full endorsement of the two-state solution. Enough of strife, suffering, and instability. We need all stakeholders to see their own interests through new lenses with long-term and far-sighted perspectives. We need solutions, no matter how political dif politically difficult they may be. A peace and prosper, prosperous Middle East is to the benefit of all of us. Thank you. I shall now, may, I shall now resume my function as President of the Council. 
I now give the floor to His Excellency Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State of the United States. Mr. President, thank you for convening this ministerial and for convening this council. And thank you very much, Special Coordinator Wenesland, uh, Deputy Special Coordinator Hastings, for your important briefings. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, we're grateful for your leadership in this incredibly challenging time, particularly in helping get humanitarian aid to civilians in Gaza. And to the entire UN team, their incredible bravery, their dedication, uh, all of those who continue to serve in some of the most difficult circumstances imaginable, uh, we express our gratitude and our admiration. I'm here today because the United States believes that the United Nations and this Council in particular has a crucial role to play in addressing this crisis. Indeed, we put forward a resolution that sets out practical steps that we can take together toward that end. The resolution builds on many elements of the text that Brazil put forward last week. It incorporates substantive feedback that we received from fellow council members over recent days. It also draws heavily on the views that I heard firsthand from partners across the region after Hamas's appalling attack on October 7, views that the United States shares. First, we all recognize the right and indeed the imperative of states to defend themselves against terrorism. That's why we must unequivocally condemn Hamas's barbaric terrorist attack against Israel. Babies riddled with bullets, young people hunted down and gunned down with glee, people, young people beheaded, families burned alive in a final embrace parents executed in front of their children, children executed in front of their parents, and so many taken hostage in Gaza. We have to ask, indeed it must be asked, where is the outrage? Where is the revulsion? Where is the rejection? Where is the explicit condemnation of these horrors? We must affirm the right of any nation to defend itself and to prevent such horror from repeating itself. No member of this council, no nation in this entire body could or would tolerate the slaughter of its people. As this council and the UN General Assembly have repeatedly affirmed, all acts of terrorism are unlawful and unjustifiable. They're unlawful and unjustifiable whether they target people in Nairobi or Bali, in Luxor, Istanbul or Mumbai, in New York or Kibbutz, or Kibbutz Berry. They're unlawful and unjustifiable whether they're carried out by ISIS, by Boko Haram, by Al-Shabaab, by Lashkar-e Taiba, or by Hamas. They're unlawful and unjustifiable whether victims are targeted for their faith, their ethnicity, their nationality, or any other reason. And this Council has a responsibility to denounce member states that arm, that fund, and train Hamas, or any other terrorist group that carries out such horrific acts. Let's not forget that among the more than 1,400 people that Hamas killed on October 7, were citizens from more than 30 UN member states, including many of the members around this very table. The victims included at least 33 American citizens. Every one of us has a stake. Every one of us has a responsibility in defeating terrorism. Second, we all agree on the vital need to protect civilians. As President Biden has made clear from the outset of this crisis, while Israel has the right, indeed the obligation, to defend itself, the way it does so matters. We know Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people, and Palestinian civilians are not to blame for the carnage committed by Hamas. Palestinian civilians must be protected. That means Hamas must cease using them as human shields. It's hard to think of an act of greater cynicism. 
It means Israel must take all possible precautions to avoid harm to civilians. It means food, water, medicine, and other essential humanitarian assistance must be able to flow into Gaza and to the people who need them. It means civilians must be able to get out of harm's way. It means humanitarian pauses must be considered for these purposes. The United States has worked relentlessly to make real these principles. We continue to coordinate closely with Egypt, Israel, and partners across the region, as well as with the United Nations, to build mechanisms that will enable sustained humanitarian assistance to flow to civilians in Gaza without benefiting Hamas or any other terrorist group. President Biden appointed one of our most senior diplomats, Ambassador David Satterfield, to lead our humanitarian efforts, which he is currently doing on the ground. The United States has committed an additional $100 million in humanitarian assistance to Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, bringing the total aid that we've provided to the Palestinian people over the past two and a half years to more than $1.6 billion. That makes the United States the largest single country donor, by far, to the Palestinian people. We call on all countries, particularly those with the greatest capacity to give, to join us in meeting the UN's appeal for the humanitarian situation in Gaza. At the heart of our efforts to save innocent lives in this conflict, and in every conflict for that matter, is our core belief that every civilian life is equally valuable. There is no hierarchy when it comes to protecting civilian lives. A civilian is a civilian is a civilian no matter his or her nationality, ethnicity, age, gender, faith. That's why America mourns the loss of every single innocent life in this crisis, including innocent Israeli and Palestinian men, women, children, elderly people, Muslim, Jews, Christians, people of all nationalities and faiths, including at least 35 UN staff members. That's why it's imperative that we work to protect all civilians in this conflict, to prevent more deaths atop the many that have already occurred. The value we place on civilian life is the driving force behind our efforts to secure the release of hostages held by Hamas and other terrorist groups in Gaza. I, as others have, had the occasion to meet with families of those missing and suspected to be in the hands of Hamas on my recent trip Several, as you know, are in this room with us today. None of us, none of us can imagine the nightmare they're living, something no family should have to endure. Their loved ones must be released immediately, unconditionally, and every member of this council, indeed, every member of this body, should insist on that, insist on that, insist on that. We're grateful to Qatar, to Egypt, to the ICRC for helping secure the release of four of Hamas's hostages, but at least 200 more, and again, from many of our nations, are still in the grip of Hamas. So, again, I implore every member here, use your voice, use your influence, use your leverage to secure their unconditional and immediate release. Third, we're all determined to prevent this conflict from spreading. This goes to the principal responsibility of the Security Council, maintaining international peace and security. A broader conflict would be devastating, not only for Palestinians and Israelis, but for people across the region and, indeed, around the world. To that end, we call on all member states to send a firm, united message to any state or non-state actor that is considering opening another front in this conflict against Israel, or who may target Israel's partners, including the United States. Don't, don't throw fuel on the fire. Members of this council, and permanent members in particular, have a special responsibility to prevent this conflict from spreading. I look forward to continuing to work with my counterpart from the People's Republic of China, to do precisely that when he visits Washington later this week. Now, it is no secret to anyone in this room or on this council that for years, Iran has supported Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and other groups that continue to carry out attacks on Israel. 
Iranian leaders have routinely threatened to wipe Israel off the map. In recent weeks, Iran's proxies have repeatedly attacked U.S. personnel in Iraq and Syria, whose mission is to prevent ISIS from renewing its rampage. So, let me say this before this Council, and let me say what we've consistently said to Iranian officials through other channels. The United States does not seek conflict with Iran. We do not want this war to widen. But if Iran or its proxies attack U.S. personnel anywhere, make no mistake, we will defend our people, we will defend our security swiftly and decisively. To all the members of this Council, if you, like the United States, want to prevent this conflict from spreading, tell Iran, tell its proxies, in public, in private, through every means, do not open another front against Israel in this conflict. Do not attack Israel's partners. And we urge members to go a step further. Make clear that if Iran or its proxies widen this conflict and put more civilians at risk, you, you will hold them accountable. Act as if the security and stability of the entire region and beyond is on the line, because it is. Fourth and finally, even as we address this immediate crisis, we all agree that we must redouble our collective efforts to build an enduring political solution to the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. The only road to lasting peace and security in the region, the only way to break out of this horrific cycle of violence, is through two states for two peoples. As President Biden has underscored from day one, Palestinians deserve equal measures of security, of freedom, of justice, of opportunity, of dignity. And Palestinians have a right to self-determination and a status of their own. Now, we have no illusions about how hard it will be to achieve a two-state solution. But as President Biden has said, we cannot give up on peace. Indeed, it's precisely in the darkest moments, like this one, that we have to fight the hardest to preserve an alternative path, to show people, making it real, improving their lives in tangible ways is possible. Indeed, it's necessary. We've heard many countries express support in recent weeks for a durable political solution. Our message today is this. Help us build that solution. Help us prevent the spread of war that will make two states and broader peace and security in the region even harder to achieve. Members of this Council, we stand at a crossroads. Two paths lie before us. The difference between them could not be more stark. One is the path offered by Hamas. We know where it leads. Death, destruction, suffering, darkness. The other is the path toward greater peace, greater stability, greater opportunity, greater normalization and integration. A path toward people across the region being able to live, to work, to worship, to learn side by side. A path toward Palestinians realizing their legitimate right to self-determination and a state of their own. Nothing would be a greater victory for Hamas than allowing its brutality to send us down its path of terrorism and nihilism. We must not let it. Hamas does not get to choose for us. The United States stands ready to work with anyone ready to forge a more peaceful and secure future for the region, a future its people yearn for and so deserve. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank His Excellency Mr. Blinken for his statement. Now I give the floor to Her Excellency Mrs. Catherine Colonna, Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs of France. Mr. President, Mr. President, I'd like to thank the Secretary General and his personal representative and the Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process and also the Deputy for having briefed the Council. I welcome
crisis. It's very worrisome in terms of the humanitarian situation and dangerous because the region is facing a conflagration. Our council must act now and shoulder its responsibilities. It's its duty and it's our duty. It is our duty to condemn unambiguously Hamas's terrorist attack and that of other terrorist groups against Israel, a massive, inhumane, abominable attack, an attack against civilians assassinated in cold blood, tortured, raped. No one can challenge the reality that on the 7th of October, Hamas, a terrorist group, launched an offensive against a UN member state, Israel. This terrorism also struck France. 30 French people died and nine of our people are missing. There are reportedly hostages. I reiterate our call for all hostages to be released immediately without conditions. Children, including French children, are today most probably being held hostage in Gaza. No one within this council can accept this. All hostages must be released. In light of this attack, I'd like to reiterate that France unswervingly stands in solidarity with Israel and unfailingly supports its security. Israel has the right to security. Israel has the right to defend itself and protect its people so that such an attack never, ever happen again. The President of the Republic reiterated this again today in Israel. I went there nine days ago and I saw the pain and the suffering of the people. Israel has the right to defend itself while respecting international law, in particular international humanitarian law, and therefore to protect civilians. We're all aware as well that Hamas does not at all represent the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip where Hamas reigns with terror. It is holding the population hostage. It just brings suffering because of the violence of the fighting and it, Hamas brings a terrible humanitarian crisis. Given this humanitarian crisis, our duty, including that of Israel, is to guarantee ongoing provision to civilians, including women, children in Gaza, of basic goods of water, food, medicine and fuel. Civilian lives must be protected. Any loss of civilian life is a tragedy. In order to achieve this, we need to ensure safe, swift, unhindered humanitarian access, but also sustainable access to the Gaza Strip. We must also ensure the respect for international humanitarian law and its principles, humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. We must also call for humanitarian pauses to be set up a humanitarian truce that will ultimately lead to a ceasefire. I talked about this on Friday in Cairo during the Summit for the Peace organized by Egypt, and I welcome Egypt's uh, efforts. And also this was reiterated yesterday to the French Parliament. Uh, over the weekend, two humanitarian convoys were able to cross the Rafah crossing point, and they need to continue to enter Gaza. The Secretary General said it. The entry of these trucks is a question of life or death for the inhabitants of Gaza. Their number of these convoys must increase. More needs to be done because the needs are enormous. Each civilian counts, each minute counts. France is engaged in tackling the humanitarian needs. Just like the EU, it has increased its humanitarian assistance to the people since the start of the crisis. France has mobilized 20 million uh, additional uh, euros in supplementary humanitarian aid for the population of Garda through the UN and UNRWA and the WFP, the ICIC, and NGOs. Um, I would like to commend them. France has also chartered a special flight with emergency humanitarian aid for the Palestinians to assist efforts conducted by Egypt that we encourage. The sum total of our assistance to the Palestinians will thus in 2023 reach 100 million euros. We therefore have furthermore the duty of preventing a conflagration of the entire region. We, France has undertaken to stop a spillover. Certain stakeholders need to refrain from benefiting from the current situation. We need to uh, be very blunt here. We caution them against any uh, regional escalation that would drag the region into a downward spiral. A conflagration, a conflagration rather would not benefit either the region nor 
anyone else. The seriousness of this situation, sir, reminds us and urges us that it is our duty to pave the way for peace once again. We need to act to create the favorable conditions for a lasting political solution that can meet the legitimate aspirations of Palestinians and Israelis to live in peace, not pitted against each other, but alongside each other. The conditions for this lasting peace are well known. The uh, indispensable guarantees to Israel for its security and a state for the Palestinians. The only viable solution is a two-state solution, the two-state solution. This is what France has always defended and will continue to defend. I mentioned this on uh, Saturday in Cairo, and the President Macron will say this again today to the Israelis and Palestinians and regional partners. We must do all we can to mobilize in order to achieve this. The Council must mobilize and fully exercise its responsibility. It's high time for this to happen. The president of the uh, country of France wanted, wanted to go to uh, Rabelais, and he managed to do so, and he has met with President Abbas right now. We need to do all we can to mobilize in order to find political prospects. This council needs to fully exercise its responsibility here. It is high time for it unambiguously to, con to condemn, rather, the Hamas terrorist attack against Israel that it calls to respect international law, including humanitarian law, and calls for deliveries to the aid for to be delivered to the population in Gaza. This is why France voted in favor of the draft resolution presented by Brazil. I would like to thank Brazil for its efforts. And this is why France will continue to support any council initiative that is just and based on our common principles. This council must act, and it must act now. Mr. President, the UN Charter came into force 78 years ago today. We're here to serve it and to serve the cause of peace. Today is a difficult day and France calls on everyone to shoulder their responsibilities before the Charter and before humankind. Thank you very much. I thank His Excellency Ms. Colonna for her statement. And now I give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Michel Onanga Ndiaye, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Gabon. Thank you, Mr. President. Monsieur le Président, President, at the outset, I should like to thank you for having organized this open ministerial debate at a time when the situation in the Middle East is worsening every day and requires the utmost attention from the international community. I would like to seize this opportunity to congratulate you also for your country, Brazil's presidency of the Security Council this October. I would also like to welcome the participation in this debate of the Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, and commend his efforts to foster the peace process in the Middle East. I closely followed the enlightening briefings from the deputy, uh, from the special coordinator, Mr. Tor Wenesland, and the deputy special coordinator for the Middle East peace process, resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator for the occupied Palestinian territory, Ms. Lynn Hastings. The horrifying attacks by Hamas in Israel on the 7th of October last are once again a tipping point in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The toll from the fighting between Israel and Hamas is reaching dizzying heights and worsening by the day, with thousands dead and injured, abductions, atrocities committed against women, children and older persons. Gabon reiterates its robust condemnation of these acts of savagery and urges the captors to release all hostages. The release of two hostages of American nationality on the 20th of October and then two more of Israeli nationality on yesterday is an encouraging sign. We recognize Israel's right to legitimate defense, but whilst upholding the principles of proportionality, precaution and distinction. 
The siege of Gaza is pushing the levels of human distress to unbe an unbearable point. Indiscriminate airstrikes have claimed thousands of lives and caused immeasurable destruction over just a few days. The recent attacks against the Orthodox Church and the Ali Arabi Hospital in Gaza are the dreadful reflection of an escalation of violence which is surpassing all limits. My country, Gabon, condemns violence against civilian infrastructure and recalls the fact that health facilities and their personnel must be respected and protected under all circumstances pursuant to international humanitarian law. I wish to pay a heartfelt tribute to the humanitarian workers who are continuing their activities with devotion in often hostile conditions at the risk of their lives. Still on the humanitarian front, we are closely following the delivery of aid to the Gaza Strip at the Rafa crossing, which began on the 21st of October. This is, I believe, a glimmer of hope for the millions of Gazan people clamped within the vice-like grip of the warring parties with no drinking water, food, gas, fuel or electricity. In this regard, we welcome the efforts of Egypt and the United States and launch an appeal for a continuous opening of this crossing point, given the critical situation on the ground. President, when confronted with its responsibilities, our Council has unfortunately been unable to surmount its differences. Gabon, my country, voted in favour of the two last draft resolutions, driven by a deep desire to bring an end to the abuses and to protect civilians. We regret the fact that our Council was unable to reach consensus. The immediate cessation of hostilities and an, unhin an unhindered access for humanitarian aid to the people in need are vital and urgent. We must work further to silence the guns and achieve an enduring solution commensurate to the gravity of this crisis. Gabon believes that it is high time for humanity to prevail over political and geopolitical alliances. Clearly, the current conflict cannot be understood only in the wake of the events in recent days. An examination of the root causes of this conflict is an urgent necessity. The continued policy of expanding settlements, demolitions and evictions, particularly in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the blockade on Gaza, religious provocation, terrorist attacks on Israeli soil, the recurrence of bellicose speech, as well as the seizing of tax revenues that Israel collects from workers from the Palestinian Authority on its behalf, all of these are major obstacles to building global, just and lasting peace. The manifest violations of international law and the resolutions of the Security Council, particularly resolutions 1860 and 2334, must urgently cease. Given all of the above, Gabon, my country, reaffirms its attachment to the two-state solution, the Palestinian and Israeli states living side by side on the basis of internationally recognized borders with Jerusalem as their capital. Moreover, in the context of a peaceful coexistence of Israeli and Palestinian people, Gabon also recalls its attachment to upholding the status quo of the holy sites of Jerusalem and recognizes the crucial role of the Kingdom of Jordan as custo official custodian of the Muslim holy sites of Jerusalem. President, the escalation in hostilities places us in the context of a war whose impact on the region is unquestionable. We must prevent the situation from becoming mired down and the opening of other fronts in the region, particularly in West Bank or the south of Lebanon, which would make the regional environment still more volatile. Gabon notes the holding in Cairo of the Peace Summit on the 21st of October and urges regional and international protagonists with an influence on the parties to lend every support to initiatives aimed at dialogue and peace in, peace in the Middle East. Finally, President, my country reaffirms at this sacred day for the United Nations, our deep conviction that only diplomacy, dialogue and negotiation with a central role for the United Nations 
are the channels to achieve a sustainable solution to this conflict, a solution which would ensure the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination and the legitimate right of Israel to security. Thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Onanga Ndiaye for his statement, and I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Igli Hassani, Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs of Albania. Thank you, Minister Vieira, for the invitation and for organizing this uh, high-level meeting. And thank you, Secretary General, and to the briefers for the sober description of the situation on the ground. The terrible events of October 7 represent the deadliest single attack on Israel's history. Albania stands with Israel, like with every other nation under attack, in its legitimate right to self-defense in accordance with international humanitarian law. In such difficult and defining moments, Israel and its people need the support of the community of free nations in responding to terrorists who have committed horrible crimes and continue to question its right to exist. We profoundly believe that there is a way to ensure the security of Israel and ensure the protection of innocent civilians. Innocent lives matter equally, be that Israeli or Palestinian. This is why every measure and every precaution must be taken not to harm those who don't deserve it, those whose lives have been put in danger by Hamas and other terrorists and extremists. Hamas. Their leaders who live a comfortable life outside Gaza and their supporters knew very well what they were doing when they unleashed the beasts to kill, burn, massacre, and kidnap everyone they could. They were hoping to trigger a massive response from Israel, knowing very well that civilians would be caught in the middle. Their hope and their win would be to make the world turn against Israel. But we must not be fooled. There is only one party that is rejoicing with what is happening. It is the country known to sponsor of terrorism in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Syria, anywhere they can. It is the country that is known for and continues to destabilize the entire Middle East. Mr. President, Albania condemns any justification and glorification of the terrorist attacks. It is crystal clear that the aim of Hamas is not to protect the Palestinians. Their actions do not represent them. Therefore, it is high time for all Palestinians to realize that their fight to self-determination, their dream for statehood, their aspirations for a better life in security and dignity will never be realized with Hamas and the likes. They must be the first to turn against acts of horror, against the unacceptable and the unjustifiable. Hamas is denying them their present. It is stealing their future. Mr. President, developments in the Middle East have always resonated around the world. They unleash strong passions and emotions. We are worried by a frightening increase of the level of anti-Semitism, fueled by hatred, by misinformation and disinformation, propelled to very dangerous levels, in particular through the social media. Anti-Semitism has never disappeared, but what we see nowadays is simply unacceptable. We should not stay indifferent in face of calls and behaviors that come from the Nazi playbooks. We must not let the fabric of our societies be torn apart by misconceptions, by hate speech, by discrimination, and by reviving despicable behaviors that have produced one of the darkest moments in human history. We have said it never again, but we must keep it, be vigilant, react, fight for it against all those who fume the flames of division and discrimination. Dear members of the Security Council, as we heard, the humanitarian situation in Gaza is dramatic. We condemn the attack on the al ahli hospital last Tuesday and call for full, full investigation of those responsible for such act. We welcome the arrangements made so far for the humanitarian convoys into Gaza with water, food and medical supplies. Although much more is needed to meet the needs, efforts must continue and diplomacy must always prevail. We commend the efforts of Egypt, the United States, Israel, and the Secretary General in this respect. The humanitarian aid for civilians should flow unhindered to all those in need, and the provision of fuel and restoration of electricity must be ensured. The normal and unhindered flow of humanitarian assistance must be guaranteed by humanitarian poses. We welcome the release of hostages and every effort in this respect 
deserves praise. Civilians should have never been kidnapped in the first place and all must be released unconditionally. Last but uh, by no means least, everything must be done to avoid the spillover of the conflict which would destabilize the entire Middle East. We condemn the Hezbollah attacks on Israel and call on them to refrain from unprovoked actions and fully comply with United Nations Security Council Resolution 1706. Provocative, threatening and inciting rhetoric do not help. It is time to act with maturity, with messages of caution and responsibility. Israel needs and deserves security. Palestinians need and deserve their state. The issue of Palestine should not continue to remain an unfinished business to poison international life and serve as a false pretext to the extremists and terrorists who use it for other aims and gains. There is urgent need to bring back a perspective for the future, especially for Gaza, once the hostilities are over. Albania reiterates its support for two states for two peoples, democratic and viable Palestine and a secure Israel, living side by side in a peace and security and in full recognition with their people enjoying equal rights and equal dignity. In concluding, Mr. President, I would like to, to express Albania's uh, full support for the U.S. draft proposal that addresses all the core pertinent issues on which we hope the Security Council will show unity. And I thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Hassani for his statement. And I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Ian Borg, Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs and Trade of Malta. Thank you, Mr. President. I also thank the Secretary General and uh, the previous in today's session. The situation in the Middle East has been precariously fragile and unsustainable for too long. Discussions in this chamber often focused on the violent escalations, unilateral measures, injustice, socio-economic inequality, human rights violation, dangerous rhetoric, hate speech, and other warning signs. It was evident that this volatile situation was pushing the conflict to a precarious edge. Our worst fears were realized on 7th October, when Hamas committed a despicable and deplorable terror attack against Israel, which we have condemned without reservation. The situation has now already resulted in the deaths of thousands and affected thousands more. Malta acknowledges Israel's right to self-defense and its duty and responsibility to protect its people. At the same time, we also emphasize that such actions must be consistent with obligations under international humanitarian law and in line with the principles of distinction and proportionality. Mr. President, at the beginning of the current crisis, we had underlined the need for steps in the right direction. In this context, we welcome the news that four hostages have been released and greatly appreciate the efforts by all involved to this end. We call on Hamas to release all remaining hostages safely and unconditionally and without further delay. We are also gravely concerned at the current humanitarian situation in Gaza. Thousands of Palestinians have been killed, many of whom are civilians, including women and children. Scores more are likely still buried under the rubble of leveled neighborhoods. Walter condemns all attacks against civilians, UN, medical and humanitarian workers, religious places, as well as civilian infrastructure. We call for an independent investigation into the blast at Al Ahli Baptist Hospital on the 18th of October. And we stress that whoever is responsible must be held accountable. International humanitarian law must be respected by all. We are deeply concerned by the decision taken by Israel to cut off the supply of water, electricity, food and fuel into Gaza. This action is resulting in dire humanitarian consequences for the civilian population. It will inevitably lead to a public health catastrophe due to compounding effects of mass displacement, inadequate sanitation, and waterborne diseases. Parties must adhere to their obligations to allow the safe, rapid, unimpeded, and sustained delivery of humanitarian aid through the Rafa crossings and 
to establish humanitarian corridors and safe zones. We commend efforts made by the United Nations, the United States, and Egypt in this regard. We must also note that this conflict has already had a disproportionate effect on women and children on both sides. Over 200 people, including women and children, are being held hostage by Hamas. Internally displaced women and girls in Gaza are at an elevated risk of gender-based violence, including sexual and psychological violence. It is in view of these extraordinary levels of suffering that Malta strongly reiterates its call for the establishment of an immediate humanitarian pause. Mr. President, the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people should not be confused with the terroristic group of Hamas. It is crucial that this distinction is made clear to all to avoid further inflammatory polarization and potentials of regional escalation. Neither can we lose sight of the West Bank. Since the 7th of October, killing, violence, and forced displacement of Palestinians has seen a sharp increase, including through settler violence and hundreds of arrests. We call on parties to de-escalate and exercise the utmost restraint. Avoiding further conflict fronts, particularly on the Israeli-Lebanese border and in the West Bank, is crucial for regional peace. Parties with influence must take steps to achieve dialogue which promotes peace. In this vein, I would like to once again recall the importance of adequate measures to suppress the financing of terrorism, ensuring that terrorist groups do not have access to financing is a basic condition for promoting peace. In closing, Mr. President, Malta remains committed to a lasting and sustainable peace in the Middle East. A peace which is based on a two-state solution along the pre-1967 borders, addressing the legitimate aspirations of both sides, with Jerusalem as the future capital of two states, living side by side in peace and security, in line with the relevant Security Council resolutions and internationally agreed parameters. I reiterate our call for de-escalation and ensuring the safe and immediate release of all hostages. Ultimately, the only viable path towards peace remains clear. A just and comprehensive resolution of the conflict where violent acts have no place. I thank you. I thank you. ...diplomatic activities that can lead towards de-escalation and the improvement of the humanitarian situation, including the Cairo Summit for Peace over the weekend and ongoing negotiations to free the hostages. We pay deep respect to the efforts by the United States, Egypt, and the Secretary General that led to the entry of aid trucks through the Rafah crossing into Gaza. But more is needed, and we should encourage further steps to continue to deliver life-saving assistance to the Palestinian people in Gaza without delay. The United Action of the Security Council, which has the primary responsibility for international peace and security, is needed now more than ever. The silence of the Security Council is not acceptable and we must move forward promptly. Mr. President, the current conflict has demonstrated yet again how, vi how vital the two-state solution is. Japan supports a two-state solution whereby Israel and future independent Palestinian state live side by side in peace and security. We must not give up on peace. Israeli and Palestinians alike deserve to live in peace, security, and dignity. In concluding, uh, let me make three points. First, we need Fairness. We need to express sympathy, condolences, solidarity with and feel pains as, uh, as, on, uh, as ours with all innocent civilians, regardless of their nationality, ethnicity, or religious beliefs. Rule of law has to apply equally. Second, we need to be clear about our objectives. It's two-state solution through diplomatic effort. Third and last, we need pragmatism. However ideal a proposal may be, it does not help it if it is not very unfortunately implemented. We need to capitalize on proposals that make difference on the ground. This Council's task is to agree upon the most meaningful implementable steps we can hope for and not to scrap proposals just because they are not ideal. 
It goes without saying that pragmatism should not compromise humanitarian international law or international humanitarian law. What we need now is to help innocent lives, not political games. I thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Japan for his statement, and I now call the representative of Ghana. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by thanking the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, for his remarks. I'm also grateful to Special Coordinator, Mr. Tor Winnesland, and Deputy Special Coordinator for OCHA, Ms. Lynn Hastings, for their in-depth briefings. The events on the ground are indeed sobering. We take note of the measures being taken to ensure de-escalation of the hostilities and allow for diplomatic and mediation efforts to address the ongoing war as well as the dire humanitarian situation. We are meeting this, this afternoon or this morning on a day that is celebrated globally as UN Day, 78 years since the founding of this organization. Ordinarily, it is a day to reflect on the need for the promotion of global unity and the centrality of the UN Charter. But the ongoing hostilities and the ensuing humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip cast a shadow on this auspicious day. It is also regrettable that the Council has not as yet been successful at reaching consensus on a comprehensive humanitarian response since 7th October. While we welcome the opening of the Rafa crossing border between Egypt and Gaza to allow a convoy of 54 trucks containing much needed humanitarian aid to enter Gaza, we are aware that a lot more needs to be done to meet the needs of, of the over 2 million people in Gaza. Mr. President, following the 7th October attacks launched by Hamas in southern Israel and the abduction of Israeli citizens and nationals of other countries, the government of Ghana condemned the actions of Hamas and called on the group to cease its attacks and release the hostages without condition. We are very much concerned by the continuing holding of the hostages, four of whom have been released. The reported deaths of 1,400 Israelis and 4,300 Palestinians, mostly civilians, children, and the elderly, and the destruction of about 40% of housing in Gaza since 7th October. We note that the continued hostilities, which has extended to the West Bank, Syria, and Lebanon, portends great danger for the region and for global peace and security. We are equally concerned about the destruction of public infrastructure and private properties, not only in Israel and in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, Syria, and Lebanon. According to the UN, the relentless bombardment has directly hit Anwar facilities, such as schools, hospitals, places of worship, and shelters, and displaced about 1.1 million civilians, including around 13,000 Anwar staff and staff of other humanitarian agencies. We mourn the loss of innocent lives and wish a speedy recovery to all those injured in the war and hope that all the displaced people in the affected areas will find a safe place to shelter. Mr. President, while commending the personal efforts of the UN Secretary General, leaders of Egypt and the United States, their governments, and the UN Emergency Relief Coordinator and staff in negotiating the opening of the Rafa border crossing, we appeal to the government of Israel to allow the delivery of more humanitarian aid and urgently needed supplies, especially fuel, which is badly needed to power health centers and water treatment plants in Gaza. We are grateful to Egypt, Qatar, the USA, and relevant countries for the release of the four hostages and the International Committee for the Red Cross for facilitating the process. We call on Hamas to release all those in their custody without any preconditions. We also call on all parties to the conflict to recognize their non-negotiable legal obligations under international humanitarian law and human rights law to protect the lives of civilians wherever they are and at all times to refrain from attacks on civilian facilities and infrastructure. We believe that this council has an obligation to continue consultations in order to reach consensus in an expedited manner on a resolution that addresses the immediate crisis that is ongoing in the region, including the dire humanitarian situation facing millions. Mr. President, in concluding, Ghana reaffirms her belief that the path to lasting peace and stability in the Middle East runs through the two-state solution, with Israel and Palestine living side by side within secure and recognized borders, 
on the basis of the negotiated 1967 borders. We urge all stakeholders, especially political leaders on both sides, to refrain from inflammatory actions and rhetoric and pursue confidence-building measures and strengthen mutual trust in order to address outstanding issues through direct dialogue. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ghana for her speech, for her statement, and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Mozambique. Mr. President, Mozambique wish to thank Brazil's presidency of the council for convening this important meeting. We praise Brazil's leadership and uh, the way it has been conducting our work, particularly since the eruption of the conflict on the 7th of October. On this day, 24th of October, the United Nations Day, we wish to express our gratitude to the Secretary General and through him to the workers of the United Nations for their dedication to our organization. The Secretary General's trip to the Middle East a few days ago, bears testimony to his courage and integrity in the face of a difficult crisis that uh, the world has been facing. We thank uh, the briefers, Mr. Tor Wenisland, UN Special Coordinator of the Middle East Peace Process, and Ms. Lynn Hastings, Deputy Special Coordinator, the Resident Humanitarian Coordinator for the Occupied Palestinian Territory for their insights and update on the current uh, situation in the region. Mr. President, the situation in the Gaza Strip has been a source of grave concern for the international community particularly since the attacks of October 7. This is a humanitarian crisis that has been ongoing for years and claiming many innocent civilians. Mozambique associates itself with the collective efforts of this council aimed at ensuring the protection of civilians and the respect for international human rights law and international humanitarian law. There is an urgent need to open up humanitarian access corridors to ensure that those in a dire need have access to basic uh, supplies such as water, electricity, food, and medicine. In this regard, we reiterate our call on the parties to de-escalate the tension, stop the bloodshed, halt the attacks, and stop the human suffering in the occupied territories and Gaza Strip, and allow immediately and unconditionally access of humanitarian assistance to the desperate citizens in absolute need. With the humanitarian tragedy in Gaza unfolding before our eyes, we call on the international community to ensure respect for principles and rules of international human, human rights, international humanitarian law, Geneva Conventions, and their protocols. We reiterate the importance and the uh, our collective duty of protecting civilians and civilian infrastructures always, everywhere, and at all times. Mr. President, as Security Council members, it is our duty and responsibility to work together 
in a united manner and with a unified voice to contain and solve the conflict, to bring to an end the cycle of violence and prevent a regional escalation. We hold the view that peace is always possible if dialogue between the parties prevails based on justice, uh, observance of the principles of self-determination and mutual recognition. We wish to remind once again that the Charter compels the parties and indeed the entire international community to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. Mr. President, we urge the parties to pursue the path of dialogue, working together in a constructive manner for a lasting peace, respecting the principle of the two-state solution in accordance with the relevant Security Council resolutions. I thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Mozambique for his statement. Uh, there are still a number of speakers remaining on my list for this meeting. I intend, with the concurrence of members of the Council, to suspend the meeting until 3 p.m. The meeting is suspended.